Hi, I'm David Flores, and welcome to our multi-part series on getting started using strobes in your photography. Now, adding strobes to your kit opens up a world of storytelling possibilities that weren't always available with ambient light or even continuous lighting. Now, you may be thinking, where do I even begin? How do I know which light to use? How does it work with my camera? How do I use it to get the desired effect? Well, we hope to answer all of those questions and more in this series. First up, let's go over what a strobe is and how they work. Now, there are many different models out there. Let's break it down. Now, when we hear the term flash, most people conjure an image of the classic shoe-mounted light that's used extensively in documentary and event photography. And those are fantastic tools, but in this series, we're going to focus on the lights commonly referred to as strobes or studio strobes. Now, these tend to be much larger, more powerful, and have faster recycling times. Recycling time refers to the measure of time between flashes that the unit needs to cycle back up to full power. There are three main types of strobes. Pack and head systems hold the energy in a generator and release through a proprietary cable to a flash head or heads. Pack and head systems tend to offer the most power and the fastest recycling times. They require a bit of time to set up. There's a bit to manage with cables required for both power and heads. Mono lights combine a generator and head in a single unit and require only a single cable for power. And though not as powerful as pack and head systems, mono lights offer respectable recycling times and faster setup and breakdown. Battery powered strobes simplify setups even further by eliminating the need for cables of any kind. And this also frees the photographer to shoot on location without hunting down power outlets or carrying cumbersome generators. As a general rule, battery powered strobes don't offer the power output or fast recycling times of mono lights or pack and head systems. The energy of a strobe varies. Some lights may be 250 watt seconds, some 500, some are even 1000 watt seconds or higher. Now a watt second, it's just that, the amount of energy measured in watts available in one second of time. Whatever the watt seconds of your strobe, the adjustment of that power can be equated to f-stops. If you're looking at the B1, you can see that the power is on a scale from 2 all the way up to 10. Increasing or decreasing the power by one full number is the equivalent of either adding or removing one full stop of light. Now, some strobes allow users to vary the output in even smaller increments. Fine tuning can be taken even further with light modifiers. The amount of power that you need from your strobe is directly related to what you're trying to make a photograph of, how fast your lens is, and what camera you're using. If you're photographing portraits, products, or anything small, you might be perfectly fine using lower wattage. As the scale of your photo shoots grows or speed becomes more critical, you might need faster, more powerful lights. If you're planning on photographing large groups of people or a vehicle, you might require thousands of available watt seconds of light. Again, it all depends on your needs. Over time, you may end up with a multitude of sizes and powers in your light kit. Now, many strobes have menu systems and controls that allow you to make all kinds of changes on the light itself, and it's definitely a good practice with any lighting system to spend some time going through those menus and those controls, figuring out how to get the most out of the light. With a light like the Profoto B10, the menu, it's not overly complicated. Submenus and other bells or whistles, they're only there when you need them. One of the most useful tools built into many strobes is the modeling light. Now, this feature allows the photographer to compose and set focus using a continuous light. Of course, this light is turned off during exposure. If the only source of light in the room is coming from your strobe, this is a no-brainer. You'll want to have the modeling light on the whole time. A good habit to get yourself into is using the test button to trigger the light whenever you change the power. When you dial the power down by a stop or two, give the test button a press so the flash can dump excess power and properly cycle up to the desired setting. This will ensure the strobe is always outputting just the right amount of power. Now, Once you understand the ins and outs of your strobe, figure out which one's right for you, you'll have to connect it to your camera in some way. Some strobes utilize sync ports that tether directly to the camera by wire. Others use wireless radio control. On top of that, multiple units can be synced together and fire in unison from one remote. Now, I'm going to be shooting with my Fujifilm GFX 50S and the Godox 8600 Pro. Now, the benefit of using the sync port is that there's very little chance that interference can get in the way of the flash unit going off. 
The drawback is that I'm tethered and it's harder for me to be mobile. Now, this is the benefit of having a radio control unit right in the hot shoe of the camera. It allows me to make changes to my light right from the top of the camera. If I want to dial in another stop on my key light, I just power up from the remote and I'm ready to shoot. Once you've got your strobe set up, it's time to dive into the camera and make sure that it's set up correctly to work with your lights. Join us in the next video where we'll be covering manual versus TTL shooting, second and rear curtain sync, high speed sync, shutter speeds, and all other relevant camera settings so you'll be able to make a picture. Make sure to subscribe and ring the notifications bell. You'll be the first to know when our next video drops. For all things strobe photography, visit b and I'm photographer David Flores. See you next time.